that it would be impactful and powerful, and we know that it never returns to you void. And we thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Lighthouse Church. Good morning to our E family, those who are watching online today. Special shout out to my mom who's watching. She'll be 88 this year and uh, excited to still be able to love on her. Uh, also, a special shout out to Frankie and Denise who are watching this morning. And uh, I'm excited that you're a part of this day. So, happy Mother's Day to the mothers. Mother's Day is always a uh, very conflicting day. It's a day of celebration for most people because if you're not a mother, you have a mother, right? So, but also it's a day of mourning and sadness for some who lost their mother or lost a child this past year. So there's all kind of emotions going on. So I'm not going to go there this morning. I'm going to preach about a, a mother's son who was thrown to the lions today. <laughs> if you turn to Daniel chapter 6, we are in the sermon series, Defying the Den, Defying the Den. And let me just say uh, to the people upstairs, I don't have any screen on the back TV. No screen on the back. Thank you. <laughs> Defying the Den. We've been talking about how to live a godly life in an ungodly world. And Daniel is that perfect model for us. He's our perfect example for us of what that looks like. Because as we've seen in his story, from the time he was a youth, he was carried into a foreign culture where they didn't believe or even know about God. And there he's lived his life and he's made a difference. Daniel literally has changed the nations with his influence for God all alone. There was no church, there was no synagogue, it was just him and God. And so we are learning from him how to do that. So uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. Uh, I've lost two things with me this morning. One is my reading Bible, and the second is my glasses. So <laughs> I'm going to read with you from the screen, okay? <laughs> Verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. With three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel, and the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the entire kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to figure out grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the laws of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king, King Darius, and said to him, may King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed, well, that's a lie because one of the governors is Daniel, <coughs> that the king <coughs> should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. What happened? Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persons, which cannot be repealed. So, King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. 
and he shut the windows and he quietly prayed. Is that what it says? No, no. Three times a day he got on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asked, asking God for what? For help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. O oh, king, did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days anyone who prays any God or human being other than you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, why, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. Because he was a friend. He liked Daniel. And he determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to the king Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issued can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and they threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be able to be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. And at the very first light of dawn, the king got up, hurried to the lion's den. When he came to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to rescue you from the lions? He's listening. He's hoping. And then a voice, Daniel's voice, answered and said, May the king live forever! <laughs> My God sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. And the king was overjoyed, and he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted out of the den, no wound was found on him because, because, because he had trusted in his God. Amen? At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And listen to this. Before they even reached the floor of the dens, the lions had overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations, all the peoples of every language in all the earth, this is the scope of the influence of those who let their light shine in darkness. Amen? May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence Yahweh, the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. And he endures forever. And his kingdom will not be destroyed, and his dominion will never end. <laughs> and he rescues, and he saves, and he performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth, for he has rescued Daniel from the lion's den. Last verse. So Daniel 
prospered during the reign of Darius and during the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Is that an awesome story? You know, it's not just a story. It really happened. Daniel chapter 6 is one of the most iconic stories in the Bible. I mean, people from even most all major religions in the world, wherever, what country you go, have heard about the story of Daniel and the lion's den. You can imagine the hundreds of thousands of sermons that have been preached from this story. And so my goal this morning is not to give you something new or unusual. I don't think, I don't think that anybody has not tapped into this verse. But I want to stay true to this series and see from this story how we can learn to live in an ungodly world. Daniel here once again shows us how to be sacred in the secular, how to be a light in the darkness, how to overcome the enemies of our soul. So let's dig in here and see what we can learn. Specifically, I want to give you six lessons from the lion's den. And we're going to do three of them this morning, and then next week we'll do the next three. So let's look at, just jump right in right away. Lesson number one, we see from the lion's den that we just read about. And this is the lesson. Age is not a factor with God. Now you say, well, where do you see that in the text? Well, it's there, but it's written in. You just can't see it. There's a lot that has happened since the last verse of the last chapter the last lesson called The Writing on the Wall, if you remember that sermon two weeks ago. By the way, last week, Pastor Appreciation, Linda and I just want to say thank you so much. That was just a very special day for us, and we are just so grateful for your, your cards, your gifts, your love, your words of appreciation, the Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> And others have called and texted and sent cards in the mail. We are just so honored to be your pastor. And the way that you treat us is very special. You say, well, don't all churches treat pastors that way? No. <laughs> and I've had some pastors from churches that, you know, weren't as loving as you are. That's for sure. So we are very great, grateful. But since the week before that, we talked about the writing on the wall. Remember that? In chapter 5. And in that chapter, we found Daniel before the second king that he served under. So first, he served under King Neb, we called him King Nebuchadnezzar, and then Belshazzar. And chapter 5 ends with the fall of the Roman Empire and the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire. We talked about this in the last lesson I'm just reviewing and so the city of Babylon has fallen into the hands of Darius the Mede. And the date is 539 B.C. Darius, if you remember, is co-regent now with the emperor named Cyrus. Last week we read in the prophecies hundreds of years before Cyrus was born. Ezekiel prophesied, or Isaiah prophesied that, that a, a leader would be born by the name of Cyrus, mentioned his name, and that he would write an edict that would allow the Jews to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and rebuild the city. Well, this is the Cyrus. Now that is the emperor and co-regent with him is this man Darius, who was in charge from the capital city of Babylon. But the truth is, is that Daniel is never going to be a part of the remnant that returns to Jerusalem. He's going to die there in Babylon, having never went back to his home country. He's going to spend his entire adult life there as God's missionary. And so that's a huge leap from chapter 5 to chapter 6. In chapter 6, Darius has just begun to set up his new kingdom 
and he puts in place a government structure. And in verses 1 and 2, we see what he's going to do. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom and three administrators to rule over them, one of whom was who? Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer. So he, he takes over this huge kingdom, and what he does is he begins to divide it into 120 different sections. I want you to think of the United States of America being one nation, but there's 50 different states, each unique with its own governor. That's the same model that we use that was given by Darius in the Bible 3,000 years earlier. So Darius makes these 50 states and puts what he called, or and puts what, uh, he, he does 120 of them, and he puts a, a, a prince, if your Bible says prince, some say satraps, basically think of governor over that, over that providence, there's 120 of them, and then over the 120 governors, he has three vice presidents, so to speak, that are administrators that make sure that Darius's governmental creeds are put into action. <clears throat> Daniel is one of those top three guys. And he was chosen as one of the top three over the empire. Now, what you don't see that we've been talking about is that Daniel has now served 65 years under two other kings. You would think at the age of 84, that Daniel would say, no, nope, I'm going to retire. It's time for me to get some sand between my toes. I've served faithfully two different kingdoms. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to lay low and let somebody else rule. No, he didn't. And one of the things you notice in the story about Daniel is that kingdoms rise and fall empires rise and fall, but there's one thing that remains the same throughout the book of Daniel, and that is Daniel. <laughs> Daniel continues. Daniel's out, Daniel outlives and outlasts four different kings. He's 84 years old, and he's still saying, I'm going to serve my God, and whatever he wants to use me, I'm going to let him use me. Last year, you know, you had a big celebration for me because I turned 60 years old. I don't know if you were trying to like say, okay, pastor, time to push out. <laughs> but somebody sent me, uh, sent me something I want to share with you. It's not, I didn't write this. So I don't know who wrote it. It's anonymous. But somebody sent it to me and I kept it because I really liked it. I thought someday I'm going to use this. You know, I grew up as a teenager in the 70s. And uh, it was a lot different world in the 70s. Think of 1974 versus uh, 2024, okay? So in 1974, it was all about long hair, right? Anybody remember that? In 2024, it's all about my longing for hair. <laughs> in 1974, I was listening to eight tracks. Remember those? Yes. Now it's all about cataracts. <laughs> In 1974, it was KEGs, kegs, keg parties. Don't raise your hand if you remember those. <laughs> now in 2024, it's EKGs. <laughs> In 1974, it was about streaking. In 2024, it's about leaking. 1974, we had Acid Rock, ACDC, Led Zeppelin, all those, right? Yeah, 2024, it's about acid reflux. 1974, Staying Alive was a song, right? The Bee Gees, Staying Alive, Staying Alive, remember that? 2024, Staying Alive is the goal. 1974, wait a minute, I thought I edited this out. Well, it's up there. I might as well use it. In 1974, 
I was hoping that one day I would have a BMW. 2024, I'm hoping for a BM. And uh, 1974, moving quickly, going, going to, the thing was about going to a hip joint, right? The, the newest hip joint, right? But in 2024, it's about getting a new hip joint. In 1974, it was the Rolling Stones that was popular. Now it's Kidney Stones. In 1974, I thought I edited this out. Bell bottoms, now in 2024, it's big bottoms we're concerned about. 1974 was about disco. In 1924, let's go to Costco. In 1974, we, whatever, right? But now it depends. <laughs> 1974, I want to rock and roll all night. Now it's, I just want to sleep through the night. <laughs> so in the kingdom of God, age is not a determining factor. Sometimes God uses young people and calls them into ministry and uses them in a mighty way, even children. And sometimes God uses people who are mature, people who are older, and calls them to do things, great things, and all in between. I just want to tell you this morning that if you're here this morning and you are young and you feel like God wants to use you, he does. And you don't have to wait until you're old. You don't have to wait until you're mature. You don't have to wait until you've had all the experience. When God puts his hand on you, he wants to use you. Paul wrote First Timothy in First Timothy 4 and 12 and says, don't want anyone look down on or despise your youth, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and life and purity and in faith. Sometimes God chooses people who we might think have been put out to pasture, right? Moses like people like Moses and Caleb. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 7. I love this verse. It reminds us Moses was 127 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. He was 80 years old, 80 years old when they went into the desert. Think about that. Caleb, in Joshua 14 and verse 10, one of the two who went into the promised land, he says, so here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this mountain. <laughs> give me this hill country. And that hill country he was referring to was the Anakites, the giants of the land that the Lord has promised me this day. I want to say to you this morning, what's important to God is not your age, it's your attitude. It's not how much experience you have, it's how much faith you have. It's not even your abilities, it's your availabilities. And if you're here this morning and you're a young person, I want to encourage you to give everything you have to Jesus Christ and see how he will use you right now in your life. And if you're here this morning and you are older, if you are mature, if you are, <laughs> don't think that God is finished with you. Amen? Your youthfulness may be gone, but your usefulness is not. Amen? Amen. The Bible does not teach retirement. In the kingdom of God, we don't retire. We just reposition. We stop doing the labor and we start overseeing the labor. Rather than focusing on providing for our family, now we are focusing on the next generation. We stop storing up wealth, and we start giving away our wealth, and we start investing in the future. Amen? So if you're here and you're feeling out to pastor this morning, let me just tell you that you are not old, you are aged. And like fine wine, and cheese, <laughs> you are aged to perfection, and you get more valuable each year with God. Amen. One person said amen. <laughs> Was it because I said the word wine, you, you're upset about that? <laughs> 
First lesson we learned from Daniel, he's 84 years old and he takes control of the governor of the region. The second one, second lesson is this. Jealousy is deadly. Number two, jealousy is deadly. Look at verse three. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. The king planned to set him over all the others, the whole kingdom. I look at the next words. At this, <laughs> when this happened, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds against him. Everything was fine when Daniel was just one of us leaders. Everything was fine when Daniel was just a governor like me or just an administrator like me. But when the king decides to put Daniel in charge over them, what happens? Jealousy, envy, right? Favored over them. Everything changed. They no longer call him Governor Daniel. Look how they refer to him when they come to the king. He's not, law, he's not one of the administrators. He's not one of the governors. What do they say? They say, one of the exiles from Judah. He's not even one of us. He's not an equal. He is less than us. And the reason why the king favored Daniel is the same reason why the other kings all favored Daniel. It was because of Daniel's excellent spirit. It was because of his spiritual gifts of wisdom and his integrity. Let's read verse 4 again. They tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was neither corrupt nor negligence. This verse is the very definition of integrity. One of my mentors told me integrity is this, that when people make accusations against you, you live such a life that even if it was true, no one would ever believe it. Someone else said integrity is what you do in the dark when nobody is looking. Daniel is the definition of integrity. They searched and could find no fault in his life to bring an accusation against you. And they were threatened by this. Here's a truth that I need you watching online and those of you in this room to get. A lot of people won't say this to you, but I'm gonna say it to you because it's true. We see it here in Daniel. People will always be intimidated by your integrity. I'm going to say that again. People will be intimidated by your integrity. Most people, even your Christian brothers and sisters, will not be as excited about God's favor on your life as you are. Can I get a witness? Y'all are really quiet this morning. <clears throat> I'm just going to preach to those online. <clears throat> Be assured that when God is blessing you, somebody else is cursing you. When God puts his favor on your life, you think, well, everybody's going to be so excited. I, wait, I can't wait to tell them about what God has done. And you tell them and they say, must be nice. <laughs> right? Must be nice. Anybody ever said that to you? God blessed you with something. Maybe it was a new car. Maybe it was a new house. Maybe it was in a promotion at your job. Maybe it was a grandbaby. Whatever it was, God blessed you with it. And you're, and you're all excited about it. And then you want to share that good news with your brother or your sister. And they say, well, it must be nice. That's envy, right? Daniel was highly favored and blessed by God. But Daniel had been through some stuff, folks. Let me just say that to those of you whom God has blessed your socks off like he has me and Linda. He has truly blessed our lives and we give him all the praise and all the glory for it. But I want to I I tell you this morning that, that when, when God blesses you and puts his favor on you, people are going to be envious of you. They're going to be jealous of God's favor, of your integrity, of his blessing on your life. But don't let that steal your joy because guess what? They don't know your story. They don't know what you've been through. Daniel had been through some stuff. 
Daniel had lost his whole family and his whole land, and he had lost a lot in his life. They had no idea what Daniel had been through. They didn't know his story. They just saw God's favor on his life. So don't you let the naysayers and the that must be nicers steal your joy. If God has blessed you, he has brought you through some stuff. He has blessed you because you've been faithful to him in some difficult and hard times. It's okay for you to say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Have some joy in your life. I don't know what you've been through to be where you are. It must be nice to have that nice house that you live in. Well, it must be nice to work 80 hours a week for 10 years. <laughs> Hello, anybody hear me? <laughs> Maybe this isn't spiritual enough for you today. <laughs> Always be humble. I thank God for what he has done. But while Daniel was upstairs praying, his enemies were downstairs plotting. The Bible's filled with examples of jealousy, envy. I'm going to put four examples up on the screen. One is Cain. Cain, remember Cain? Cain was jealous because God had accepted his brother Abel's offering and didn't accept his. What about the second one? Saul. Remember King Saul? Saul, who was praised by everybody, the first king of Israel, but a young man, David, comes up and cuts off the head of the giant and goes to battle, and everything that David does, God has his hand of favor and his anointing upon his life, and they start singing the song, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands, and Saul got envious, and then he got jealous in his heart. Joseph's brothers, Joseph, the youngest, right, the youngest of the 12, and he's the one that his father has an eye for, and he gives him special attention, and he makes him a coat of special colors, and he shouldn't have done all this, but, but, but the fact is that his brothers were envious, and they were jealous of him and the father's attention on his life. Look at the Pharisees, the Pharisees who heard Jesus teaching and saw all the crowds rushing to hear Jesus. We never heard anyone teach like this man. We have Pharisees, they teach, they're boring. This man, he not only teaches, he teaches with authority. And look at the demons are running out of people. Now everybody's getting healed. And they were envious and they were jealous of God's favor on Jesus. And what is the common denominator in all four of these examples? And there's many other examples in the Bible, but just these four. What is the common end result of all of these? Destruction, violence, violence. Cain killed his brother. Saul tried time and time again to kill David. Joseph's brothers tried to kill him, ended up selling him into slavery. The Pharisees ended up killing Jesus. There's a difference between envy and violence. Or envy and jealousy. Envy is when you want what somebody else has because you don't have it. And let's be honest, I think a lot of us, putting us, like me in there, we struggle with envy at different times in our life. We do, right? Like, <coughs> I, I, you know, uh, I look at this young man right here who just retired. Congratulations on your removal. No, congratulations. But you know, I, I could be I could be envious because he's older than me. And look at all the hair that's on his head. <laughs> I could be envious of his hair. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, that's there. And uh, but I'm not envious because I know that God don't put marble tops on cheap furniture. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not. I could be. You know, I could be. It's the difference between envy and jealousy, but jealousy is more than just wanting what someone else has. It's feeling threatened by another person's success or feeling insecure like you're going to lose something because they gain something. And when envy grows into jealousy, if we don't check that and get that out of our lives, it is always going to end in violence. 
Either the person that you are jealous of, you're going to destroy them, or the jealousy that's inside of you is going to destroy you, or probably both is going to take place. I know this isn't exciting on Mother's Day to talk about envy and jealousy, but God is saying to you this morning, you need to deal with that jealousy in your heart before it kills you or somebody else. The other rulers in our text here were more than envious. They were jealous of Daniel. They were trying to take him out. This is why the Bible warns us about envy and jealousy. Let's read a few scriptures Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet, that means envy, want, your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his servants or his oxen or his donkey or anything else that belongs to him. You say, well, that's not a relevant scripture for today. Yes, it is. Right across the street, one of our church members has some Horses and donkeys. I just want to say to Teresa, I know you're watching this morning. I'm not envious of your donkey. <laughs> I don't want your donkey because I see every day you have to go and feed it and water it and brush it. You can have your donkey. I'm not envious, really, I'm not. Now, if you had an ox, that may be a different story, but when it comes to your donkey. <laughs> but anything that somebody else has... Whether we think they deserve it or not, we've got to be careful about that. James chapter 3, verse 14. But if you harbor, in other words, if you hold it in, you don't deal with it. Bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, even demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition... There you find disorder in every evil practice. You see that? The truth is that so many bad things that happen, their root cause is jealousy. Proverbs 14 and verse 30, a heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. That's the moral, the inside of you. If you don't deal with envy and jealousy, it will destroy you like a cancer from the inside out. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 tells us what love is. Love is the answer to envy, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not envious. It does not boast. It is not proud. And so as brothers and sisters in Christ, as children of God, when we see God bless somebody, we should be more happy than they are. We should be so excited when God blesses and puts favor and promotes people. We should celebrate that. We should thank God for that. We should bless them as God has blessed them. Jealousy should be no part of our lives, especially in the church. Amen. Lesson number three, our kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom is not of this world. Verses six through 10, the government leaders conspired a plan to take Daniel out. They knew the power of the government because they were part of the government. They knew that in this new system, the systems of the Medo-Persian empire, that the emperor was seen as a god, and even worthy of worship, like a deity. And seeing him as a god, they also meant that whatever he wrote and made a decree, it was as though God was speaking, and it could not be changed. And so they used this against him, and they conspired against Daniel and come up with a plan to asked the king to make this decree in writing as a law that could not be changed that for the next 30 days, if they prayed to any other god except for him, they'd be thrown in the lion's den. Of course, Darius doesn't know anything about their motive. He is filled with pride himself, right? And so they use his pride and milk him and butter him up and brown nose him, or if you want to say, make him feel better about himself and who he is and their submission to him, 
and they trick him. And they do this because they know that he, as already mentioned in the text, has special favor, special love, special affection for Daniel. And he would never do anything to hurt Daniel. And so they trick him and he signs the decree. So there's this conflict here once again. And this is now the third time we've seen it in the book of Daniel where Daniel is living a dual citizenship. He's the kingdom of heaven. He worships the one and only true God, but he's living as a citizen in a foreign country that does not believe in God, does not believe in Yahweh. They have many gods, a plethora of gods, and they live heathen lives, and his standard of living is completely different than theirs, and he shows us now, here, once again, he is asked and forced by the government to do something that goes against his beliefs, against his faith, against the word of God. What does he do? Does he compromise? Does he give in? No. He stands strong. So I want to talk for just a moment about God and government because, you know, we're going into an election season now. And what, like six months from now, there's going to be a presidential election and there's lots of uh, stuff that's going to be flooding and filling the airways and lots of controversial things and all of that. So I just want to take a moment here and just talk about God and government. And <clears throat> I want to read a few scriptures to you. And these scriptures will really speak to themselves. How do we live in a culture and under a government that is becoming more and more secular. How do we live as sacred? What do we do? When do we stand and when do we sit down? When do we stand up? When do we sit down? And the Bible speaks to us, Romans 13, verse 1. Let's read it together on the screen. I'll read it for you. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Now, keep in mind here that the Apostle Paul is writing this under Roman rule. You know, an anti-God government. A government that's going to be persecuting Christians for their faith. And he writes and says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God established. The authorities that exist have been established by God, that God is sovereign over the nations, the wicked and the righteous. Verse 2, consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For one in authority, that one is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for the rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on wrongdoers. In other words, the government is put in place not, not to teach us spiritually, the government is put in place to protect us from evil and injustice and to reward the righteous, reward those who do what is right. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And this is also, he says, I know you don't like this, it's in the Bible, this is also why you pay taxes. <clears throat> For the, I didn't write this. For the authorities are God's servants. The IRS, yes. Who give their full time to governing. I know you have a problem with paying taxes to a government that uses part of that money for things that we don't like and we need to change that. But the fact is, too, that the other side of the coin is that the taxes that we pay 
build schools and pay our teachers and give, pay our firemen and our policemen and our streets and our infrastructure and our military that protect us and defend us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Make sure we get that right. <laughs> so this passage emphasizes the importance of submitting to government authorities because they are established by God to maintain order and punish wrongdoing. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Again, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, to commend those to do right. There it is again, the two purposes of government, right? To punish those who do wrong, to protect and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that they, by doing good, you should silence the ignorance talk of foolish people. Live as free people. But do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Similar to Romans, this passage encourages submission to human authorities for the Lord's sake. And in so doing, we're silencing our critics. We're being good citizens. And we're being an example Proverbs 29 and verse 2. When the righteous thrive or rule, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people groan. We feel that, don't we? We see that in our own government's history. How good it is when we have a leader who is a righteous leader. And how difficult it is when we have ungodly people ruling our government. So what do we do about that? We need to put righteous people in office. Amen. Matthew 22, verse 21, Jesus instruct his followers, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. So Jesus himself here makes a clear distinction between our civil duties and our spiritual obligations, that they are separate. And so you hear me say this as a phrase, and I, I just want to explain exactly what, what I mean to that, what I mean by that, when I say that, not my kingdom, right? The United States is not my kingdom. This world is not my kingdom. My citizenship is in heaven. Amen? Jesus is my king. But the fact is, we have dual citizenship. I'm not only a citizen of heaven, also for a temporary time, I am a citizen of the United States of America. And so since I'm a citizen of the United States of America, I have civic duties, I have civic responsibilities, and I can make a difference in my civil duties just as I can in my spiritual duties. And so when we say, not my kingdom, the tendency could be there to say, well, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. This is not my kingdom. I don't care about what goes on in my government. I don't care about what goes on in my local schools. I don't care about what goes on in Washington, D.C. Jesus is coming back. The Antichrist is going to take over. And so we just, need to, we just need to pray and stay focused on Jesus and forget everything else because it's not my kingdom. That's not what I mean by not my kingdom. What I mean by not my kingdom is that when things get difficult and when things get hard and we get oppressed and when the government turns against us, which it will at some point in the future because we know what's going to happen, that we've got to know that our, our submission, our allegiance is first of all to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Amen. Always to his word first. Daniel lived a godly life in an ungodly government. And he influenced them by his integrity, by his lifestyle, and by the way that he worshiped his God. Hallelujah. 
And that's the example that you and I should make. We also can be involved in government like Daniel is and in decision making and in policy making and in prayer and in standing up for truth and righteousness and justice and judgment. We can make a difference in this world. And I don't want us as a church, our affections need to be on Jesus, right? You don't need to be all, when I hear and watch the news and I hear all this negative stuff, I get, I get, I find myself getting all stirred up and upset and angry and agitated on the inside. And <laughs> at that time, the Holy Spirit reminds me, wait a minute, that's not your kingdom. Your affections are not here. Your affections are above. Let me read some scriptures to you this morning. <laughs> but before I, before I read those scriptures, uh, let me just share this with you. Let me just stay on this topic for a second. This is the reason why the Puritans came across to America. Just You remember that, right? The Puritans were involved in a government and even a church that began to take away their freedoms, take away their worship, make demands on them that went against the word of God. They suffered, and I'll put this on the screen, they suffered four different kinds of persecution. First of all, there was religious persecution, right? Their dissenting beliefs and practices with the Church of England Church of England was telling them that this is the liturgy, these are the things, and when they didn't do things the way, when they challenged or questioned or wrote or preached sermons that challenged some of the things that the church was doing, the church was doing, are you getting that? <laughs> they were harassed, fines were sent out, imprisonment. They even executed some of them for refusing to worship the way they told them they had to worship. There were restrictions on this worship, and those rituals had to be followed. When they didn't do that, they began to censor them. They censored the Puritan publications and the sermons that criticized or questioned the Church of England or the reforms that they were trying to make, and they were legally discriminated against. They were excluded. They couldn't hold public office. They couldn't face, they faced legal discrimination based on their religious beliefs. All that happened in our history, and that's why they came to this country. And don't think that it can't happen in this country. But here's the difference. They, they came here and they set up a government, right, where there was freedom to worship, where there was freedom to express, where there was freedom to speak. The freedoms that we have, people died for. You remember that, right? There were valuable freedoms that we can assemble here whenever we want to in this church and worship God the way we want to and proclaim the truth and speak out against injustice and speak for righteousness and what the word of God says. But those are being eroded away from us as we speak. And we only have to look at my short history here on earth to see that in my lifetime, the government took prayer out of the public schools. In my lifetime, Roe versus Wade was made a, a law where it was legal to kill babies. In my lifetime, just here since I've been in Connecticut living, we have watched the government make same-sex marriages legal, legal and protect the rights of the LGBTQ community while stifling the voice of the church. And the reason why these things keep happening is because the church has not stood up and made a voice and said no more. We do not live in Puritan England. We live in a country where we can speak. Why are we speaking? Where we can act. Why are we acting? Where we can vote. Why are we voting? We have power, church. We can make a difference. Daniel didn't have voting in Babylon, <laughs> right? There was no democracy there, but we live in a democracy. We have this freedom, and if we're not careful, we'll lose the freedoms that we have if we don't stand up and do something about it. 
Please don't misunderstand me. You know, I am a patriot. I love the USA. I have a son who serves in the military at my prompting has taken an oath to defend this country with his life. Lavender blood, strand blood in my line has served this country and been spilled for the freedoms that we have. I love the USA. But church, we are the force that keeps back evil. And until Jesus Christ comes back, we can't stop. This is not the America that I grew up in. And it's my fault that it's not the America. And I'm not going to let it be that way for my grandkids. Until they take me out of here in a pine box or until Jesus raptures me, I'm going to do everything I can in my power to make America better, to put godly people in office, to speak out against injustice and unrighteousness. And yes, it will cost me something, and it will cost us something when we speak out against the culture and what they say is acceptable. We are going upstream against a current, but I want to tell you and remind you this morning, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Have we forgotten that the church is more powerful than the government? Amen. Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. So, what can we do? Ephesians 2.19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens of God's people and members of the household built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. Philippians 3 and 17. Join together in following. Put this on the scripture. This is really a good verse. Philippians 3.17. Dear brothers and sisters, pat in your lives after mine and learn from those who follow our example. I got a little uh, different version, I think, here. <coughs> For as I often told you before, <coughs> and I tell you again, when with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. That's the culture in which we live, Right? Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? If you want to get passionate, if you want to get emotional, let it be about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. John 18, 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, our servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. <laughs> so you see the balance there? We have dual citizenship. But as children of God, we are ambassadors of Christ. We are representatives of Christ in this kingdom on this earth. It's not our kingdom, but we're in his kingdom. And we are here by purpose and by design for God, that he placed us here for such a time as this to make a difference. And our purpose is always to preach and proclaim Jesus Christ. We have freedom to speak. We have a vote. And both of these mean that we have a choice. We can make a difference in our culture and in our country. I'll, I put this list together. We can lead the way for our country, how to do it. Number one, by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. By preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only answer, the only solution is not a new leader in, in a, a, a new party. It's not, a, not an exchange of political ideas. The only solution for America and for the world is Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Number two, by living out the gospel as Christ ambassadors. What does it do? What does it mean if we preach Jesus Christ and his kingdom and love, but we don't walk it and we don't live it? This is why in both those verses, the Apostle Paul wrote and said, you need to be servants and good civil citizens as a model and an example because people are watching your life. Number three, by prayer and fasting. Number four, by putting godly people in office at every level. 
Number five, by serving our government in office. Some of you are going to be called, and I pray for you. Oh, I pray for you, but some of you are going to be called to serve in public office, to make a difference, to be light in this dark place, to be a voice, to stand up. And I want you to take that task on with the anointing of God in your lives because Daniel did. He's our example. By policy making. Number seven, by voting. Number eight, by attendance. Attendance at what? Everything you can be at. School board meetings, right? I don't know, they let these books in my classroom in our school. And they don't know. Were you at the meeting? Did you speak up? Did you make a voice? Then you don't have a right to complain. You let it happen. I, I'm so thankful they don't, that we haven't had any issues since I've been with, here in our local school system with this stuff. But when this stuff comes here, I'd like to see the whole congregation of Lighthouse Church flood that room and there's people standing outside. We're here and saying it ain't going to happen in our schools. Amen? Amen? Speak out. Speak up. Make a difference. Don't just hand our country over to the ungodly. This is what happened more than once in my lifetime. And I don't want it to happen again. Just don't forget who you represent. You don't represent the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or an independent party. You represent Jesus Christ, the cross, the kingdom of God. I think that's important. I really do. I don't want you to get the picture as we are in the last days that the Antichrist spirit is going to get stronger and stronger and the church is going to get weaker and weaker. You're saying that darkness is more powerful than light. I think just the opposite is going to happen. I think the darker the night, the brighter the light. And I think as the Antichrist comes and tries to take over this country like he is, that the church is going to have revival and we're going to stand up and we're going to fight. And when the rapture takes place, all the heathen are going to say, Whew, man, I'm so glad those Christians are out of here. We couldn't do nothing while we was, they was here. They stopped everything we tried to do. I'm so glad that the aliens took them out. <laughs> They're going to be so glad that we're gone because we are the restraining force of evil. We're going out with victory. We're going out with power. We're not going out as a weak, crippled church. We're going out in the power of the Spirit, and they're going to be so glad that they took us out of this world. Amen. That's a good place to say amen. All right, worship team, will you come? Get ready. Get us a good song ready because we're going to worship God here in a minute. Let me give you one more. I said three, but let me give you four. It's a short one. Don't stop doing what works, right? Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, opened up the windows towards Jerusalem. The Jews prayed towards the east, believing by faith that that temple, that the presence of God was coming back. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God. I love this. Just as he had done before. Just as he had done before. You guys close the doors, please. Just as he had done before, Daniel was told, if you pray to any other God but this false one over here, you're going to get thrown in the lion's den. And what did Daniel do? He didn't stop. He said, I'm not going to stop now. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't stop now. (laughs) The first thing he did, the first thing he did in his text is he went home and he opened up his windows and he prayed just like he always did. And it's not that he prayed in rebellion. It doesn't say that. It says he prayed just like was his practice. Daniel prayed because Daniel prayed. Amen. Good preaching, Pastor. Daniel prayed because Daniel prayed. He had developed this godly habit in his life. He had a lifestyle of prayer. And Daniel did what he always did because Daniel always did what always worked. And that is prayer. 
Daniel had discovered time and time again that going to God gets results. That doing the right thing, righteousness, pays off even if it costs you your life. Daniel didn't stop because he knew it worked. You know, you guys know I like to fish. So, last week, I took one of our members fishing for the first time that I went fishing with, with, together with him. He wanted, he wanted to, to learn. He, wanted, he knew there was trout fishing here. He wanted to trout fish. He liked to trout fish. So I told him I had this honey hole, this special spot that I went to. And every time I went there, I caught my limit on trout. So I took him there, and he's, he's here in the sanctuary, so I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to embarrass him this morning, and I didn't ask him, and he didn't know. He'll forgive me later. But I'm not going to mention his name. But he may or may not be on the stage, but I'm not going to mention his name. <laughs> so I told him, I said, this is a spot, and here's what I discovered. This is what works at this spot. People fish when I'm there. People come into fishing and they're casting everything and they're not catching anything and I'm just reeling in fish after fish. And it's because I know what works. I know right where the fish are. I know what they want. They want this. It's a special kind of power bait. And I told him, we use power bait and I told him the color, right? I told him the color. Get the color that's cheese color because that's what they like. I'm telling you, I've had other people using power bait right beside me. They weren't catching nothing, but they just loved my bait. And they would, this is the secret, right? This is the secret sauce. And so we went there and I did what I always did because what I always do always works. And I put the power bait on there and he put the power bait on there and I start catching fish, right? Here's a picture of one of them. This is a brown trout. And then the next one is a picture of a rainbow trout, okay? That's actual fish we caught last week. So that's two of five. I caught my limit of five in about an hour. And he's fishing right beside me, right? And he's using the same color bait. But how many fish does he catch? He doesn't catch any fish. <laughs> He caught zero. I felt so terrible. <laughs> the thing is, is that he had power bait, but my power bait has something that his didn't have. It had sparkles. It had sparkles in it. And I knew that this bait was what would catch the fish. And so every time I go to the same spot, I use the same bait. Why would I use something else? I've tried everything else, it doesn't work. But every time I use this, I catch fish. And so I use the same thing because the same thing works every single time I've been there. Daniel had this same mentality. He said, well, I remember. I remember when I was just a young man and Nebuchadnezzar's army came to siege Jerusalem and they surrounded it and they wouldn't let anybody in or out and people were starving to death and I saw them and the skin was falling uh, the bone, uh, the meat was falling off of their, their flesh and they were eating their kids they were, they were starving literally starving to death but God always made sure I prayed and God always made sure I had something to eat and then they broke into the city and they busted through the walls and they came in and, and they started killing everybody and I prayed and God protected me I watched as they carried my mama and my daddy and my siblings I'd never see them again but I prayed and God said I've got you son and then they carried me away in chains to another country, to a people that don't speak my language in a place I'd never been, in a country that was not my own. And I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to have a life here? And I prayed, and God said, I've got you, Daniel. And he put me in a position of favor. 
And then as soon as I was in that position of favor, immediately they started making rules for us that I couldn't follow. They wanted us to eat this food that was meats offered to idols and it was unkosher. And I couldn't because the law told me not to eat that. And so I didn't know what to do, but I knew what worked. And so I prayed to God and God granted me favor. And after 10 days, they found out that without eating that food, we were bigger and stronger and smarter than everybody else because we prayed. And, 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 and then it wasn't long after that that they made a big gold statue and said, everybody's got to bow down and worship the statue. But my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were out there and they saw that they didn't bow down and they didn't know what to do. They weren't going to compromise. They were going to stand for truth and righteousness for the one and only true God. And so I prayed and said, God, God, what are we going to do? They're going to throw them in the fiery furnace. And God said, I've got them, Daniel. And I looked in the furnace by the king and I saw the three friends walking around with a fourth man that looked like the son of God. And the king said, get them out of the furnace. And they walked out of the furnace and there was not even a smell of smoke on them. And the only thing that was burned on them was the ropes that had them bound. Hallelujah. And I said, thank you, God. Prayer works. So when they told me that I couldn't pray anymore, if I did, I was going to get thrown in the lion's den. I just did what I always do because what I always do works and that is to call on the name of the Lord. And God is able to deliver me through the lions or from the lions. Either way, I'm just going to pray because prayer works. Stand with me across the room. Those of you watching online, don't shut me off yet. There's some people here this morning who are facing some lions. You're just facing some impossible situations. Maybe it's your marriage and you feel like it's almost, oh, I don't see how in the world I'm going to get out of this. I'm being thrown to the lions. I don't know what's going to happen. It looks bad. It looks like it's over. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your business. Maybe it looks like the writing's on the wall. We preached about last time, right? And it looks like it's over. I don't know. I'm going to take a loss. It's going to be disastrous. I don't know how in the world I'm going to survive this. Maybe you got a, a, a word from the doctor, and he said, you have this incurable disease, or you've got cancer, or you've got some terrible thing that's going on in your body, and we don't know what to do, and you don't know what to do. I want to tell you, we all know what to do this morning, and that is prayer. Prayer works. The same God who's with the God of Daniel is the same God who is here this morning. And God wants to know what your response is going to be. God wants to know this morning if you're going to call on him. Because he says, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. And you might have to go through the furnace or you might get delivered out of the den. But whether you go in or whether you go through, God is going to be faithful to you if you'll just call upon him. Call upon the Lord while he may be heard, the Bible says, and he will answer. The psalmist said, this poor man cried unto the Lord, and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his troubles. I'm telling you this morning, prayer works. Prayer works. And if you're here today and you're in an impossible situation, remember, with men, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. The decree could not be changed. Men's decree, but God's decree also could not be changed. <laughs> And God's decree was that Daniel would live, that he was not done with him, that he would use what the enemy meant against him for good. And the whole empire and every nation, language, and tongue under the Persian Empire would know that Daniel serves the one and only true living God who delivers. And God will do the same thing for you. So the worship team is going to sing a song. And as they sing this morning, if you're facing a situation that you need to cry out to God in prayer, 
I want to ask you to leave your chair and come down to this altar. If you're able to kneel, kneel. If you want to stand, stand. I don't care what your posture is. But God wants to know this morning what your heart is. Where's your heart? And if you'll call out to him, we have some prayer warriors. In fact, if the prayer warriors will come, if my, if my prayer altar team will just come up, and they're waiting for you here, and you're not going to be alone. We're going to pray with you. We're going to believe God with you, that God is going to bring you through, that you're going to come out of this lion's den without a harm, that we're going to see the hand of God glorified, that Jesus is going to be exalted in your situation. If you're here this morning, while we sing this song, just come down to the front and we're going to pray and we're going to believe God this morning and we're going to do what we always do and that is we're going to pray because prayer works. Prayer works. Let's sing and praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Will you come?